Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome to this session of NATO's 36th Annual Conference. On your attendee screen, you will be able to enter comments and questions in the audience chat. We hope you will take advantage of this opportunity to engage with our speakers. We recognize and thank our Petabyte sponsor, the California Healthcare Foundation. All conference sponsors have virtual booths available during the conference in the sponsors section. At the booths, you can learn more about the sponsors, review materials, request contact, and collect game tokens. We hope all attendees will take a few minutes to visit each sponsor's booth. Now I will turn the stage over to Charles Hawley, NATO's Director of Projects. Thank you, Myron, and thank you all for joining this session. I'm excited to introduce uh, the session on low value care and avoidable hospitalization. Um, let me also uh, thank again our, our session sponsor, who happens to be the bed by sponsor you just heard about, the uh, California Healthcare Foundation. Uh, we appreciate them. And uh, I will introduce this session organizer, Katie McGraves Lloyd, uh, with On Point Health Data. Katie, uh, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Charles. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's panel discussing low value care and avoidable hospitalization. I'm Katie McGrades Lloyd, a senior health data analyst at On Point Health Data. Today, we're going to hear from three projects, starting with an initiative in Virginia to measure and reduce low value care and the fallout from COVID. Secondly, potentially avoidable hospital utilization among Medicare beneficiaries in rural areas. And finally, a look into artificial intelligence techniques to identify low value care. Our first speakers, Michelle Rockwell of the Virginia Tech School of Medicine and John Moffey from the UCLA School of Medicine will discuss the Smarter Care Virginia initiative and associated impact from the COVID pandemic. Let's turn it over to Michelle and John. Hello, my name is John Moffey and I'll be co-presenting with Dr. Michelle Rockwell on global pandemic, local priorities, the impact of COVID-19 on a statewide initiative to reduce low value care. I wanna present low value care from a real patient's perspective. Um, low value care is defined as patient care that offers no net health benefit in specific clinical scenarios. James is a 64 year old man with history of mild asthma and a painful abdominal hernia who comes to a preoperative clinic prior to hernia surgery. At this visit, he gets an unnecessary chest X-ray. This finds an incidental lung nodule. So surgery is delayed. A CT scan is ordered, uh, and the CT scan shows that there never was a lung nodule, but they find an incidental adrenal mass. So the surgery is delayed again. The adrenal CT is ordered and that a dedicated adrenal CT finds that the adrenal mass was in fact ultimately benign. All this time, James lived in pain for an additional six months. He was anxious about the test results. He received unnecessary dye and radiation exposure and the scans cost more than double the surgery itself. So stories like this really led our team to launch a statewide analysis on low value care in Virginia. And working with the Center for uh, Virginia Health Innovation and Milliman's Health Waste Calculator, we looked at low value care in Virginia and found that it was not only costly and common, but that even the low cost services contributed quite a bit to unnecessary spending because of their high volume. And this study created quite a stir which inspired then the Smarter Care Virginia experiment. And this is a, an initiative funded by Arnold Ventures, a $2.2 million grant to reduce low value care across the state of Virginia over three years. We focused on seven measures of low value care that are defined clinically, uh, three routine uh, preoperative uh, services based on evidence-based guidelines like routine lab and EKG and chest x-rays, uh, cardiac imaging for low-risk asymptomatic patients undergoing low-risk surgery, as well as four other services, annual EKGs and cardiac stress testing in general for low-risk patients, a routine advanced diagnostic eye imaging, and peripherally inserted central venous catheters in patients with chronic kidney disease. 
So these were selected based on the review of guidelines and multiple stakeholders uh, providing input. So um, the study and evaluation design of this QI initiative was a step wedge cluster randomized intervention uh, to reduce the use of seven low value services across six health systems in Virginia. Um, it is a multi-component initiative, so a combination of uh, clinician peer comparison reports, performance and audit feedback, um, clinician education and, and engagement, um, using the principles of, of good quality improvement. And we were gonna look at low value and high value care utilization, adverse events, and total costs of care. So the randomized uh, intervention timeline was to st did start in July 2019, and you had uh, two health systems into three groupings, and each of these sort of cluster groupings had a staggered rollout, and that order that they were staggered was randomized. And they all received, starting in July, the small amount of funding, the, the performance reports, the education materials, um, and then, of course, in early 2020, uh, we had a major global disruption with the COVID-19 pandemic that put a complete halt to the entire study. And the intervention was, of course, paused uh, to allow the health systems to deal with the pandemic from March to August 2020. And then it was resumed um, from August to September 2020. Uh, one, and we are now requesting to pause again due to the Delta surge hitting hard, especially some of the rural health systems. And we want to resume it in February 2022 until February 2023 uh, to really uh, uh, allow for that uh, surge to pass um, and then compare it to the pre-pandemic baseline period. And then instead of three groups, we'd have six control sites uh, compared to the six intervention health systems. And instead of step wedge randomization, we'd, we would adapt to a quasi-experimental pre-post design uh, comparing intervention to control. Um, but before we can really tease out the effects of Smarter Care Virginia on the delivery of low value care, we really need to understand first, what are the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on high and low value care in Virginia? And Dr. Michelle Rockwell, my colleague, will now present just that. So thanks for your time. I'll pass it on to Michelle. Thanks so much, John. As a member of the faculty at Curlian Clinic and Virginia Tech Curlian School of Medicine, it is such an honor for our institution to participate in Smarter Care Virginia and for me personally to play a small role in the research piece that goes along with it. I'm going to present an overview, a very brief overview of our ongoing quality of care analysis. More specifically, we're using all payer claims data based data to describe trends in the utilization of high value and low value care in Virginia uh, between the beginning of 2018 through quarter four 2020. Importantly, we are examining disparities in care based on a number of factors, region of the state, payer, ADI, which is area deprivation index. It's a measure of socioeconomic disadvantage of a neighborhood and rurality. We have several hypotheses. We hypothesized that utilization of both high and low value care decreased during quarter two of 2020. Many have shown this and that it rebounded or bounced back toward the end of 2020 toward pre-pandemic rates. We hypothesize that there are service category differences in utilization rates. So for example, we predict that prescription utilization changed at a different rate than um, services like screenings and tests that require in-person care. And we hypothesize that there are population differences in the rebound of high value care and that disadvantaged populations or some disadvantaged populations experience disparities in care. So we're measuring some high value care and some low value care. The specific measures are here. They are informed by the Virginia Health Value Dashboard that John mentioned. All of the high value care is going to be measured using the Milliman MedInsight EVMs. 
The low value measures are mostly being measured by Milliman Medinsight Health Waste Calculator. A couple are being measured by some common tools used in, in quality improvement um, and policy measures. We added antibiotics to the dashboard measures, but generally we're sticking with the, the low value care measures that are commonly done in the Virginia dashboard. So our outcomes will be high and low value service utilization per 100 beneficiaries every quarter of 2018, 19, and 20. And we'll also look at results based on service category, diabetes care, cardiovascular care, and so forth, and then stratify by each individual service. So our statistical analysis in 20 seconds or less is we'll run a difference in differences analysis, which will allow us to compare quarters two, three, and four of 2020 to quarter one before the pandemic and look at the, the changes, the decrease in utilization in 2020 and those subsequent quarters compared to what we would have expected or predicted to see in 2020 based on our observations of 2018 and 2019. So we'll be able to factor in the normal ups and downs and seasonal trends that happen uh, because we have the 2018 and 19 patterns explored. Our application of difference and differences will be a rate of rate ratios analysis that I always think looking visually at stats output is helpful. So it might look something like what you see here. We'll have a graph showing what happened to high value services and low value services during quarter two, three, and four rate of rate ratios. So if utilization in quarter two was exactly what we would have expected in 2020 based on 2019 changes, it would have a rate of rate ratio of one. It would be 100% of what we uh, expected. This particular mock table is down at around 50%. So it'll be a nice visual um, as part of our output to see how the utilization changed. We're so excited to see our results and all the, the trends associated with it to inform a Smarter Care Virginia project moving forward. What better time to really understand what's happening with care in Virginia than when all these health systems are very focused on quality of care and low value care. And we also believe that our findings related to any disparities can be an important part of quality improvement and policy initiatives in the state aimed at improving care for all, all Virginians. So thank you very much. So I don't see any questions from the audience, but I can um, bring up a couple of my own. So given the COVID pandemic, are there other low value care or um, high value care measures you would consider adding to the uh, initiative? Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Katie. I can, I can take that answer. So currently um, the Smarter Care Virginia project led by um, Beth Bortz uh, the founder and CEO of the Virginia Center for Health Innovation. Um, we, you know, we are requesting to expand our purview, uh, particularly on um, um, low value prescribing um, and care surrounding uh, back pain. So I briefly mentioned in my presentation that um, the other purview of Smarter Care Virginia was to establish a, an employer uh, stakeholder task force where um, we received uh, you know, stakeholder input about what consumers or patients really think is important regarding low value care. And based on that feedback, some of the areas um, of focus that are being proposed are opioid use for acute back pain, um, imaging for low back pain. Um, these are areas that the employers and patients are very interested in. So we are currently um, requesting uh, some further input and support from our funder, Arnold Ventures, who we're very grateful for their support uh, to see if we can expand these measures um, 
and expand the, the footprint of um, quality improvement in Virginia. Thank you. And a question from the audience from Jacob. Um, do you have a strategy in mind for when you get the results to engage with stakeholders, policymakers to communicate about low value procedures to patient care providers? Yes, that's uh, a wonderful question. Um, and so Beth, uh, who's leading the employer-based task force, um, plans to um, provide uh, you know, the results of our evaluation uh, to, you know, some of the most important stakeholders in the state of Virginia. So folks like, uh, you know, heads of insurance companies, the governor of the state, uh, you know, the secretary of health uh, for the state of Virginia, um, uh, as well as, uh, you know, other patient advocacy groups. Uh, you know, she's got a board of directors that she's going to be feeding this back to. Um, and then, of course, we're going to, um, you know, try to publish uh, the results of the experiment. Hopefully it'll be successful. Um, hopefully we'll be able to show a difference um, in reductions of low value care compared with control health systems uh, at the end of this. Um, and the idea is, is that, you know, the results of our work will inform um, broader and larger uh, scope uh, initiatives uh, across many U.S. states. We're hoping to be the tip of the spear, uh, as Mark Fendrick, one of our uh, project collaborators, likes to say. So um, stay tuned. And I might just add that a part of Smarter Care Virginia that I think is, is really neat that I have enjoyed being a part of it because of is we're involving so many different levels of stakeholders. So, you know, nurses in the clinic and different managers and health systems, um, all the way up to really important policy makers um, and CEOs across the state. So it, it feels like in all hands on deck, everybody has a role in reducing low value care. I think that's been really important. And in terms of the retrospective analysis that I'm a part of, I really appreciate that, that we're going to be able to hone in on disparities. And um, of course, we're still waiting on the findings, but I hope anything that we're able to find can can be an important message to, to stakeholders moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, let's take one more question. So. Um, I wonder if you could discuss your difference in difference model in a bit greater depth. Do you have a controlled jurisdiction or are you relying on a pre post comparison? Yeah, so regarding the Smarter Care Virginia project, um, it's going to be very challenging. I'll be honest, it'll be very challenging to try to uh, separate out the effects of the pandemic uh, you know, from, you know, the effects of the quality improvement initiative. So that's just being totally upfront. It's going to be a major challenge. Um, we are, you know, having control groups are going to be uh, key in this. You, you need to have a control group. Um, we are in the process of selecting a, uh, using sort of qualitative methods of experts of the Virginia marketplace, healthcare marketplace to select comparable sister health systems to the intervention health systems that are in the same region, have a similar size, um, similar footprint uh, to our intervention health systems so that we can use those control systems uh, to see, you know, as care starts to rebound, um, you know, the idea is that we will be able to demonstrate that um, low value care rebounds at a less rapid rate <laughs> than the control systems who are not uh, part of Smarter Care Virginia. Um, and that will be, you know, done in a, in a sort of uh, a variation of a difference in difference analysis. So you have to have that control group. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to tease out uh, the effects of the pandemic. Even, even with the control group, though, it will still be a challenge. And of course, it will be a non-randomized study. So um, it'll be hard to to generate causal inference. I don't know if, uh, Michelle, you had anything else to add there. Well, to be honest, what I was thinking when I first read the question was, are we relying on a pre post comparison? We're definitely relying on a great stats team because this is a lot of data and, and complicated analyses for me. Um, but for the retrospective analysis, we're not 
necessarily doing pre-post or comparing the changes that we would have expected um, in 2020 if the pandemic hadn't happened. So we're very much basing our analysis on the 2018 and 2019 seasonal trends and annual trends. Um, so that's the comparison that, that we're making, a proportion of the difference. I hope that's helpful. Is there time to answer the, the last question or are we out of time? I think we'll save it for the end um, and perhaps other panelists can comment as well. So with that, we'll move on to um, our second presenter. So Evelyn Lee from Mathematica is going to discuss potentially avoidable hospital utilization um, for Medicare beneficiaries in rural areas. Evelyn. Hi, everyone. My name is Evelyn Lee. Um, today, I am going to present a study uh, by myself and my colleagues at Mathematica, Jake Vogler and Shulei Jeverinch. <clears throat> the title of our study is Measuring Potentially Avoidable Hospital Utilization Among Medicare Beneficiaries in Rural Communities. Uh, rural hospitals are under increasing pressure to provide high quality care and access while maintaining financial viability. High rates of rural hospital closures are well known, and at the same time, we also know that rural residents tend to be um, older and sicker than urban residents. Recent studies have shown a worrying um, trend of uh, widening health disparities be, uh, between rural and urban populations in chronic diseases, uh, life expectancy, and um, mortality. Um, hospitals are mostly paid fee for service, and this payment model has long been a threat uh, to rural hospitals' financial uh, sustainability um, as their patient population shrinks. To address this issue, uh, CMS and other uh, healthcare payers have supported various efforts to change the financial incentives for uh, rural hospitals to transform their care delivery model while maintaining access to care. Uh, one recent example is the CMMI, uh, Pennsylvania Rural Health Model. And under that model, participating hospitals receive stable revenue under prospective global budgets um, and also have a strong incentive to reduce their hospital uh, potentially avoidable utilization. So what is potentially avoidable utilization or PAU? It refers to hospital care that is unplanned or can be prevented through improved care and care coordination. So um, higher um, uh, PAU levels usually uh, presents for um, better, uh, uh, more room to improve and uh, more opportunities to for hospitals to generate high uh, shared savings under alternative payment models that pay for quality instead of for volume. Um, there are various ways to measure um, PAU. In our study, we looked at um, three claims-based PAU measure. The one is um, uh, readmissions within 30 days of hospital discharge. The second, um, admissions for ambulatory care sensitive conditions. Um, examples are admissions for uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, and COPD etc. Um, the third one is the avoidable ED visits. Um, so these are cases where immediate um, medical um, treatment is not required or conditions that can be treated in primary care settings or be completely prevented through effective um, uh, uh, primary care. Um, our study was part of Mathematica's um, initiative called the Data Innovation Lab. At an, an extension of our study is a free interactive data dashboard that focuses on rural PAU. Uh, let me bring up the um, dashboard real quick. So um, rural hospitals and policymakers often lack the data on their on PAU rates and how they compare with other hospitals within the same geographic region. So we hope that um, with this tool um, will help hospitals and um, uh, policy leaders get a better idea of their own PAU levels and make informed decision related to value-based payment models. Um, so we asked two questions in this study. 
First, how much of rural uh, hospitals revenue is associated with PAU and how much um, is that um, varying across rural hospitals? Second, what is the relationship between PAU and overall health of the um, community and the hospitals located in? Um, our study Population includes all rural hospitals located in rural areas uh, defined by the federal, uh, uh, federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And our analysis sample include about 1,900 hospitals um, after excluding hospitals very, with very low case counts and uh, small bed sizes. Our main outcome is the proportion of hospital revenue attributed to um, potentially avoidable utilization um, uh, measures that um, I mentioned um, uh, above. Our denominator is the total inpatient and um, ED revenue. Um, the uh, the, po uh, the pr proportion of revenue is not risk adjusted. We use 2019 Medicare fee for service parts A and B claims and links the hospital data to the 2019 county health ranking data, which is publicly available. So dive right into the results. Um, Overall, um, if you look at the um, chart at, uh, um, on the left, um, the orange bar shows that on average across all hospitals that we uh, in our sample, um, the average PAU uh, rate, um, which is the proportion of PAU um, uh, in total inpatient and uh, ED uh, revenue, that's 33%, um, one third of the, the total revenue. But it also varies widely um, from 7% to 67%. And the next um, uh, chart um, uh, on, the, on the right is the, um, the state medium. Um, uh, PAU rate. So, if, uh, it, um, as you see, that um, the the state median varies also widely from um, about 21% uh, in Georgia all the way to 39% in North Dakota. Um, and again, the whiskers uh, shows the lowest and highest rates in um, hospitals um, within the states. Um, so uh, uh, even within the states, we're seeing um, uh, 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 a tremendous amount of variation in PAU rates. Um, now we look at PAU rates by um, health count, uh, uh, county health rankings uh, within the state. Uh, for a given hospital, we know whether it's in the um, healthiest or low, uh, least healthy county among um, all counties within that state. So this pie chart shows that, as expected, the rural hospitals tend to uh, locate in um, uh, counties with relatively poor population health. Um, and the second, we look at the relative difference um, of hospitals own PAU rate um, compared to the um, state median um, PAU rate. So, and also to what extent um, that relative gap is related to county health. So here you see in this chart, the Y axis represents for the um, percent difference of hospitals PAU rates compared to its uh, state median uh, across all um, rural hospitals in that state. Um, and on the X axis, we broke it down um, uh, the difference by county health ranking. Um, so the bar um, on the uh, all the way on the left is showing that um, hospital PAU rates are on average seven percent lower than the state median if they are located in the um, healthiest um, counties of their states. And um, interestingly, the the difference is symmetric. Um, on the right, this is showing that the hospital rates are on average seven percent higher uh, than the state median if they're in the least um, health counties in the state. All right. So, uh, and also when we um, uh, run regressions of PAU rates on county health rankings, these differences show up as the display significant. So to wrap this up, uh, are a, a few policy implications. First, we believe that PAU rate provides key information for hospitals to assess their savings opportunities under alternative payment models. And second, the new payment models such as global budgeting has poten the potential to offer the right incentives for rural hospitals to align strategic plans to improve um, the population health. Um, so that is all. Thank you very much. Great, thanks everyone. Let's go to a question from the audience. Why is included in the health factor ranking? Does it include all people in the community or only hospital using people in the community?
Yeah, great question. Um, the health factor ranking um, does include all people in the community and it includes um, um, a four to five um, uh, factors, including behavioral health, um, uh, environmental health and health access, um, et cetera. So it's a, it, it is truly a population um, wide measure. Okay, let's go to another question from Carl Kennison. Um, what method did you use to define avoidable emergency department visits? Yeah, so in this study, we used the, the NYU algorithm to um, uh, uh, to measure potentially avoidable utilization, um, and we look at the um, the different types of um, uh, uh, um, emergency visits, including um, emergent. Um, uh, you know, non-emergent conditions, um, emergent but can, uh, primary care treatable um, and um, preventable and avoidable um, uh, conditions. So, um, and and we define the um, avoidable um, ED visits as those um, the probability of being non-emergent um, or um, uh, preventable care, uh, primary care treatable. Um, uh, as you know, the sum uh, greater than seventy percent, we uh, treat them as um, uh, potentially avoidable. So, um, and another question from Jacob is how you define health factor available publicly anywhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is a publicly available um, data set that where you can find um, from you know county health. Uh, CountyHealthRanking.org, um, um, and the the data is um, updated annually. And I believe the most updated um, measure you can find is the the 2020 data. All right, um, and I just have a question. So, um, this study focused on PAU in uh, the Medicare population. And um, what parts do you think are applicable to other populations, such as commercial or Medicaid? Yeah, great question. So um, we do um, work with um, Pennsylvania um, to provide um, the um, uh, uh, implementation support and technical assistance um, for the state to implement the Pennsylvania rural health model, which I mentioned in my presentation is a CMMI uh, model. Um, uh, to, to implement global budgets um, uh, for hospitals. And I will share that we do receive um, PAU data uh, from commercial payers um, because um, you know, uh, both uh, Medicare and commercial payers um, participant, uh, participate in these models. Um, and um, you know, we do see that readmission and ambulatory sensitive admission rates are much lower in the uh, commercial uh, rural population, but avoidable ED rates are higher um, among the rural Medicaid population than the rural Medicare population, so. Great, thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, we are gonna move on to our last presentation. So Keith Summers of Health Quorum will discuss strategies to identify low value care. Hi, my name is Keith Summers, co-founder at a health data analytics company called HealthCorum. I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to be speaking today about such an important topic. and want to thank the organizers and sponsors for making all of this possible. I also want to thank all of you who are tuning in and fighting that video conference fatigue on day three here. So I'll try to keep this concise and leave you with some valuable takeaways and insights based on the innovative work that my team at HealthCorum has been doing over the past several years. Quick bit about myself, I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts, and I began working on Health Quorum in 2016 after having firsthand encounters with wasteful healthcare spending and seeing several family members struggle with similar issues. As I started to dig in from the patient perspective, I quickly learned that my experience was not unique. In fact, over 30% of all health spend in the US is estimated to be of low value, providing little benefit to patients while often carrying additional risks. That's over $1 trillion annually, and the number keeps growing. It was this realization that led us to establish Health Quorum, driven by the mission to reduce healthcare costs through the identification and reduction of low value care. Before discussing how we help solve this massive problem, I'll give an overview of US healthcare spending and the emergence of value-based care guidelines to frame how we got here in the first place. 
So as most of you probably already know, the U.S. spends more on healthcare than any other country, both per capita and as a percentage of GDP, yet fails to achieve commensurate health outcomes. On a per capita basis, health spending has increased 31 fold in the last four decades to over 11,000 per person as of 2019. And even after adjusting for inflation, the spending multiple is about 6x. One major reason for the discrepancy between health spending and outcomes is the aforementioned trillion dollars in low value services. With expenditures estimated to reach 6.2 trillion by 2028, we can expect that wasteful spending will increase in step if left unchecked. Now, the good news is that a lot of very smart people, including many of you attending this conference, have helped lay the foundation over the past 15 to 20 years for the value-based care movement and value-based insurance design. We now have widely accepted guidelines from Choosing Wisely and other physician-sponsored organizations. But the question remains, why does the U.S. healthcare system continue to see such significant deviation from consensus industry best practices? We believe that most providers truly want to do what's best for patients, but there are many factors that complicate decision-making, whether it be human bias, information disparities, provider litigation concerns, or fee-for-service payment systems that most providers still work within. There are many reasons why low-value care keeps slipping through the cracks. The root of the problem is that tracking and quantifying low-value services is typically complex and labor-intensive, with current solutions lacking the transparency and accuracy to gain provider buy-in. There have been solutions that employ simple pattern matching algorithms to look for unwarranted variation, and there have been efforts that are largely manual and require painstaking human review, but none that combine both speed and accuracy to produce actionable results. We saw this challenge and knew there had to be a better, more reliable way. After years of development, HealthCorm has invented a method for detecting low value care procedures and medical claims data by harnessing the power of artificial intelligence to deliver more accurate results at a fraction of the time and cost. I'll now give an overview of how we accomplished this. The low value services we're targeting fall into one or more of the following categories. The treatment is not entirely necessary, the benefits are short term, or lower cost alternatives are available. Even if a procedure is relatively successful and leaves a patient satisfied, if it was unnecessary in the first place, it's falling into the wasteful spending bucket. These services may even be harmful to patients or lead to costly cascades of additional unnecessary care. So with that said, we begin by compiling recommendations and best practices from Choosing Wisely, the US Preventative Services Task Force, the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and numerous high quality and evidence-based research papers. We work with our clinical team to validate these recommendations on an ongoing basis and ensure we're accounting for any new literature or changes in consensus physician opinions as new information becomes available. An important distinction when considering these recommendations is that they're not meant to be used to establish coverage decisions or exclusions on their own. Rather, they should start a conversation about what is appropriate and necessary while also accounting for the patient's risk of disease and available treatment options. With those parameters in mind, we structured our invention so that it can be applied to any supervised learning solution to detect low value care instances in insurance claims data. Our team has tested several models and ultimately landed on using a backpropagation neural network as our supervised learning solution of choice due to its ability to deliver highly accurate results while not being too overfitted for this specific purpose. At a high level, there are two main phases to our methodology. In phase one, we construct a training data set based on de-identified real life claims that include the various instances of low value care that we're targeting. Our training is designed to reflect both correlational and directional impact of diagnostic and therapeutic low value care on patients' risk. The key here is to then assign confidence levels based on algorithms that account for the diagnosis codes and procedure mix observed in the medical events. By doing this, our trained models are empowered to tune the low value confidence levels accordingly. Our methodology allows us to incorporate health risk predictions as an ingredient to assessing the likelihood of potential low value being a real low value treatment. In phase two, we use the training data set to begin training the supervised learning algorithm, which for us is a neural network solution. Once trained and rigorously tested for accuracy, the neural network is then ready to begin analyzing claims data line by line to detect low value care. 
The end result is we can now analyze millions of lines of claims in mere minutes while still maintaining a high level of accuracy. Manual efforts have not been successful due to the sheer volume of claims and the risk reward of dedicating skilled resources for the task. But with our technology, the resource requirements are dramatically reduced, allowing healthcare organizations to spend more time taking action and working to eliminate the waste. And that brings us to the trillion dollar question. How can healthcare organizations leverage this information to cut back on low value care? At face value, the answer may seem obvious. Just present the findings to providers and bingo, they'll know what to avoid moving forward, right? But we all know it's not that simple. One thing we have learned is that providers are competitive by nature and want to see how they compare to their peers, which is why HealthForm has developed an overarching scoring system that incorporates low value care as a foundational component. We use the raw low value care figures to build metrics such as low value care cost per patient to reveal a more holistic view of how a provider is practicing relative to their peers. It also allows our clients to focus their efforts where there is the most opportunity for improvement when examining all providers in a given specialty or region, for example. This peer comparison process is extremely important and we have spent a lot of time developing methodologies to ensure that we're delivering a true apples to apples comparison for each provider. In addition to metrics centered around low value care, health quorum scores incorporate many other metrics pertaining to cost, quality, and efficiency which are tailored to each specialty or subspecialty. Many of these metrics are driven by other technologies we've developed in-house, with the prime example being our proprietary referral detection process. This technology allows us to analyze claims data and determine the likelihood that a referral took place. Referral instances that exceed our confidence threshold are mapped to the appropriate providers and used to calculate metrics, such as the rate of referrals to high-value specialists which is part of our metric set for primary care providers. There are many applications beyond this as well. Referral detection gives us the ability to tie low value imaging back to the ordering physician, rather than attributing those instances to the radiologists who didn't take part in that initial decision-making process to begin with. One last example of a unique component we leverage is our conflict of interest detection technology, which tracks payments that providers receive from pharma companies and links them to abnormal prescribing patterns for the drugs that those companies produce. Once again, instances that exceed our confidence threshold are incorporated into metrics and benchmarked against the peer group. All of this work ultimately builds towards an overall score for each provider, which risk-bearing organizations use as a single source of truth to enable various strategies for network optimization and waste reduction. Apart from the technologies we've developed, one big differentiator is the level of transparency we offer. It's not just about delivering a score on providers. Rather, it's a means to building a positive and engaging experience with providers, allowing provider network stakeholders and providers to have better and more meaningful relationships while working towards the common goal of high value care and less waste in the system. Thank you all for listening and I would love to answer any questions you may have. Um, so, one question for you: What data sources um, are you using? Yeah. So, um, we we generally say that the more the more data, the better. Um, for us, we you know we leverage CMS data. We we take uh, claims data from our clients. We also utilize um, all payer claims data sources. Then we tie in other um, data sources as well. So using public social determinants of health, um, CMS published compare statistics, Dartmouth, Dartmouth Atlas, and you know many others that help form the ingredients we need for all these different metrics that we put out there. Great. Um, so we'll take a question from the audience from Carl. Um, he says, does your AI methods use or allow for training across different payer types, such as commercial Medicaid and Medicare? Yeah, it, it does. Um, and, you know, what we found actually is that across those, um, you know, three different um, populations, we, we see pretty similar results. So we have compared, we've seen what it produces, um, looking at Medicare, looking at commercial, um, Medicaid, and, and there's really not a lot of variance from what we're measuring anyways. 
Um, so that's the good news, but it is adaptable to any of those. And, um, and we, we pay attention to see how that changes on an ongoing basis. Um, so I think we have about 15 minutes left, so I think we'll bring back the panel. Um, and actually, I will go back to a question from Douglas McCarthy. Um, so he asked earlier in the chat, I think this is applicable to everyone, how have you overcome skepticism about the ability to accurately measure low value care and hence the willingness to act on the results? So we could just um, take this presentation by presentation. So. John and Michelle, do you have thoughts? I can't hear you, John. I don't Sorry, know. Sorry, guys. Um, I, I, I'll start and see if Michelle has something to add. I, we get this question every time, and it's, an, it's a key question. It's what's the validity, the clinical validity of these measures, and are they credible? Um, and so, you know, so the truth is, is that a lot of these claims-based measures um, have not been formally clinically validated. There was one study uh, in 2019 that showed that similar claims-based low-value care measures based on choosing wisely recommendations have a sensitivity and specificity compared to chart review of about 85, 80 to 85% um, compared to professional coders reviewing medical charts as the gold standard. So moderately, you know, valid, but they're not perfect. And there's variants. Some of them are really not accurate. Some of them are more accurate. And so you have to have a humility when you share these measures. And that's why shame when you're using these kinds of measures is absolutely the wrong approach because they're not accurate and you'll lose all your credibility. Uh, instead, you, you acknowledge these are imperfect measures. They may be broadly directionally valid, but not in any single individual case. They're valid on, on the scale of a population, but not on an individual patient. So as long as you have that humility and you approach physicians with that humility and say, help us understand this variance, you know, we're, we're confused because, you know, this clinic there's about, you know, 90% of the time we see, you know, antibiotics prescribed for this upper respiratory infection. Whereas in this other clinic, it's, it's more like 10%. Can you help us understand this variance? We're, we're a little confused. So that that's the approach that has to happen because the measures are not perfect. They're not valid. And so don't use shame. Uh, you know, it, it's a collaboration. So I just I'll, I'll end there and see if Michelle, you want to add anything? That was a really good answer. Um, better than what I'm going to say. But what I would add is we have found it helpful to spend a little bit of time explaining the measures that we use and the details because a lot of times i think it does build trust in in the measures because what's coming to a lot of clinicians mind is all these exceptions and no those might not be picked up by the measures but the common um low value care the big numbers are generally being caught up so explaining how the measures work has been helpful and also sometimes it, the the accuracy of the me measures is definitely a legitimate concern of uh, clinicians. I also think it is a convenient um, reason or, or something to cite when it's just really hard to stop stop low value care from moving forward. So if we give a pathway or tools to improve low value care, that might make that concern um, improve in itself. Thank you. Um, Evelyn, did you have any thoughts you wanted to add? I think you may be muted. This should be good. Um, yeah, so um, totally agree with um, uh, what John and Michelle said and just wanted to pile on and say that data is a tool and not the solution in order to make the um, the findings, you know, um, in order to make it actionable to um, to reduce um, uh, low value care, um, you know, the the providers, um, either hospitals or physicians, really need to look into where are the diagnoses of the um, low value care or the um, uh, uh, potentially avoidable utilization is happening among their patients and and develop specific. Uh, strategies and, and care pathways to um, target um, these um, 
you know, patients and, and patient groups. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think John made a good point um, that you can't just uh, pick out a specific instance and, and say that's 100% low value care, right? But um, on, on more of a overarching scale and putting it in the context of how one facility or one provider is doing it compared to the peers in the area um, is important to, to start having a discussion of, you know, why, why is there variance and, you know, is it justified? And even after doing um, corrections and, and accounting for patient mix and all of that, um, is it still existing and, and how come? So um, I think that's important and that collaborative approach is, is the right way to go about it for sure. All right, so I see some other questions come in. So Helen asked, how about military? Any data regarding the military? I wonder if this is directed specifically at Keith, um, at your data sources, but also on others. Yeah, you know, we haven't we haven't segmented for that um, yet. So something that's on our roadmap, but not to date right now. Okay. Um, and Helen, feel free to add additional clarification if we didn't address your question. Um, so next one we'll move to Sarah. Do you ever provide clinician level data to the providers who are engaging in this work? Um, I could start. Um, so, so in Smarter Care Virginia, um, the health systems themselves are um, providing clinician level data. So at the, at the practitioner level and also at the practice level and the health system level. Um, most of the feedback has been electronically, partly due to the pandemic. Um, we had hoped that more of it would be face to face, um, but that hasn't been, uh, uh, that has not been, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's been happening, but um, I think that's where the rubber meets the road. And that is, uh, you know, and, and we wrote an article recently on, on how to do this. It's called, it's published in AJMC this past year, 10 step pro, a 10 step program to reduce low value care led by Howard Beckman. Also Beth Bortz was a co-author and it talks about mostly human psychology. So data is a tool, but you have to realize you're dealing with humans with personalities. And so you are going to face with anger. You're going to be faced with resistance. You're going to be faced with resentment sometimes, and you have to be prepared. You can't go in, uh, you know, like a deer in headlights, uh, and get eaten alive. So you have to go in with humility, transparency, integrity, and, and you're going to get anger. Um, common response. I don't believe these data from a physician. I, I don't believe these data. I think they're inaccurate. And we write in the article, here's, how, here's, your, here's your script. You say, tell me why you think it's inaccurate. And, um, you know, and then, you know, why don't we work together to try to make it more accurate? And we'll, you know, we can, we can give you another iteration. And then you turn an enemy into an ally. I mean, it's easier said than done, obviously, in, in a heated moment. But there are stages of change. Uh, the Kubler-Ross stages of change, it's real. It happens uh, when you give this feedback and you have to be prepared, you have to have tools. So you can check out our article. To answer the military question, there was a paper in Health Affairs in 2019 uh, where they assessed low value care uh, in the military led by Dr. Colamus. Um, and it showed that low value care in the military was, was common and costly. So it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's timeless. Great, thank you. Um, now we'll move on to a question from Carl. Um, since about 30% has been identified as waste, but most measures of low value care don't come up to 30%, suggesting this is a rich area for a lot more work and additional measures to identify potential low value care. Any thoughts on what are significant areas for further work in defining? Um, I can start. Um, I'll take the avoidable ED visits as an example. I think um, there there are um, multiple ways, um, clean based ways to um, measure avoidable ED visits, and they have all um, different um, um, criteria and definitions. But one thing that, um, that that would push this research 
one step further is to distinguish different types of available ED visits, either based on the care pathways or uh, truly preventable diseases. So for example, whether um, this avoidable ED visit happened because the patient um, you know, got in trouble in the middle of the night and had nowhere to go, um, but ED, or is it because of um, you know, a health condition that um, could um, have been prevented if um, um, you know better there there was better um, primary care and, and health prevention. Great. All right. Next, let's go to a question from Jeff Stoddard. Are you aware if any of the value-based payment models address the issue of low-value care? Happy to try this one. I mean. They have not, I mean, I'm not aware of value based payment models uh, that overtly focus uh, on low value care as a major focus. Um, of course, you're aware of accountable care organizations um, that are sort of risk based contracts over time, longer periods of time that, that don't specifically target low value care. There's only two or three heat disc and CQA quality measures that focus on low value care. It's antibiotics for upper respiratory infections, low, you know, imaging for low back pain. Um, prostate screening for men over 70. But beyond that, those are the few metrics of overuse that um, any kind of value-based payment contract will include, such as an ACO. Um, but beyond that, it's uh, very, very little focus on it. Um, and so that, that's really, and that gets at the, uh, the, the previous question, when you actually try to measure it using claims data. So we did an analysis of Milliman uh, MedInsight waste calculator in Virginia the amount over you know 48 measures or so the amount of waste dollars was about two percent of the total uh state budget uh, on health spending so it is an incremental amount but that's just the tip of the iceberg that's what we can easily measure with claims data i think the next generation needs to target the bigger uh ticket items uh such as hospitalizations and ed visits but also procedures um surgical procedures that are very costly those are going to be much harder to get at appropriateness using codes and claims, maybe impossible. So I think the next uh, stages need to focus on variation analysis and doing it very well and carefully uh, and having even greater humility about the ability to discern waste uh, based on a single claim. Great, thank you. So I think we only have about a minute left, so I'll just pose the last question. Um, so. John, you talked a little bit about um, sharing this information with providers um, in a more welcoming way, but I wonder to the panelists, how do we, how do you make these results actionable? I can jump in there. I, I think it's important to, um, to set it up in such a way that it's uh, tr traceable and trackable over time, make sure that it's consistent and that what you're measuring um, you know, you, you have a thesis that you're that you're following on it. So, um, putting that in a way that's you know uh, simple, easy to easy to look at, easy to understand, um, and and fair to everyone, making sure that there's no bias involved in in the process is uh, really important to gain the buy-in and also to um, have it be statistically significant on an ongoing basis. I would just add that there was a, a recent systematic review published of interventions that have aimed at in reducing overuse related to the choosing wisely um, recommendations. And out of 131 interventions, the ones that have been most effective are the ones that involve multi-component interventions. So performance reports, education, practice facilitation, academic detailing. So different methodology and strategies to help practices and providers build it into their workflow. The, the regular principles of quality improvement that are hard and fun, but the stuff that works for helping us do more of things can help us do less of things. Yeah, lastly, I just wanted to add that um, engage your patients, the uh, empower patients with their um, the, the awareness of their own health and, and their, their power to, to manage their own health. Great. Thank you, Evelyn. So I believe we're at time. Um, so we're going to conclude for now. But um, thank you, panelists. Thank you, Nato. Um, and thank you, attendees.
have a great day.